Uh, so to discuss the 2018 outlook for this important industry, we're very pleased to be joined today by one of its leading experts, Dr. Charles Hall. Dr. Hall is uh, currently a professor in the Ellison Chair in International Floriculture at Texas A&M University. A native of North Carolina, Charlie has his bachelor's in agricultural economics and master's in ornamental horticulture and landscape from the University of Tennessee and his PhD from Mississippi State. He's been on the faculty at both the University of Tennessee and now Texas A&M. So, so certainly here as we begin March Madness, uh, uh, Charlie's got the Southeastern Conference well covered throughout his academic career. His, his academic work and in consulting includes strategic management, outlook, and financial analysis with green industry firms. In addition to his academic roles, he serves as the chief economist for American Hort, uh, the primary trade association for the industry, and received, has received numerous awards for his service to the industry, his academic work, and his teaching. And we're certainly pleased that he's been a contributor for many years to Farm Credit East Insights and Perspectives Outlook publication. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Charlie and uh, look forward to his presentation. Thank you very much, Tom, and uh, welcome to everyone that's online this afternoon. Um, this is a great time to be in the green industry. This is one of those times where, um, it, as, as I like to say down here in the South, you know, it's time to make hay. And so I, right from the get-go, I'm going to start with some good news and, and say that if you, if you if you can't make money this coming spring, then I'm not sure uh, what to do for you because it's everything is set. The stage is set, right? It's just like a, a play or the theater and so forth. The stage is set for someone to do well uh, this year in the green industry. And so with that, um, I do need to provide a little bit of caveat. And that caveat is ceteris paribus. Now that's, a, that's an assumption that we economists came up up with a long time ago, even in the days of David Ricardo and Adam Smith and so forth, we were talking about ceteris paribus. And that little phrase, it's Latin, and it means holding all other things constant. Well, the fact is, is that there's very little in life that remains constant, even in the green industry. So there's some, some risks that are ahead of us. And so one of the things that um, we have to be aware of are those risks both production risk, environmental risk, marketing risk, uh, regulatory and legal types of risk. So we need to be able to address all those factors of risk. And I'll come back to that when I make my recession forecast towards the end of the program. And I put that at the end because that helps keep everybody you know, in tune right up until I get to that point. So we'll get there in just a second. Now, this very first slide is one that I love including in just about every presentation I do. It's simply a, a, a supply chain diagram of the green industry. And right away, down at the bottom, you've got your allied trade folks, all the, all the folks that make the inputs that we use to transform into plants by the nursery and greenhouse firms. You can see my cursor right there in the middle of the screen is in that yellow uh, oval circle. And so you, you see the nursery and greenhouse firms right there. And down below is all, all the allied trades to make all the inputs, um, all of the, uh, the containers, the fertilizers, the, the plant control products, uh, pest control products, and so forth. The, the, that's the group that produces all these things. Now, just from the get-go, let me say that I just finished up a study looking at the costs uh, that have increased for growers over the last decade. That is, since the, the last recession, the Great Recession, the last 10 years, costs have increased on average by about 22% for growers, right? And at the same time, price hasn't risen by 22%. And so immediately, one of the biggest issues in the industry right now is margin compression. That is, the profit margins are not what they used to be. And of course, banks and, and, and lending institutions see that uh, before a lot of people see that. And so it's, it's perfect for the audience today. Now from this, this circle here, we go up, at, up towards the top end of this slide, towards either the landscape sector on the right or the retail sector on the left, and then the almighty consumer is right up there at the top. Now, you'll notice some dollar figures, and Tom was talking about the importance of the green industry in the Northeast. 
And if you look nationally, the latest numbers uh, at the grower level, it's a $31 billion industry nationally at the grower level. On the landscape side, about $92 billion. And then up here at the retail, it's $59 billion. So right away, you see the landscape service sector is actually larger than the retail sector. That is all the Lowe's, Home Depot's, Walmart's, all the garden centers, farmers markets, all those retail outlets that you see there in, in this box represents about 60, just shy of $60 billion. <clears throat> Whereas the, the landscape service sector is about 92 billion. Now these are 2013 numbers, which brings me to another point is that my colleagues and I will be doing the next green industry survey next spring, that is spring of 2019. Actually, we'll kick it off in January and we'll be collecting 2018 data. Now, you, uh, many of you um, that I know there in the Northeast have received our surveys before and you have filled out those. And I appreciate that because this information is critical. And you say, well, why is it critical, Charlie? Well, for one thing, when we go to, to Washington or we go to our state legislatures and we try to influence policy, the only way we can do that in terms of either financial policies, fiscal policy or monetary policy or environmental policies or labor related policies, the only way we can do this, we have numbers on the, our impact and the difference we make in, in people's lives and businesses across the country. So that's one of the reasons this information is important. But that's not the, the point of today's uh, webinar. So let's, let's move on from there. I will say, if you look at these red numbers here, like the, next to the growers is minus 14%. That's how many that we are down from 2007, right before the Great Recession, we have 14% fewer nursery and greenhouse growers in the country. Now, how about that? Now, if you look up here on the retail side, we've lost about 3% of our retailers, but look over here on the landscape side. We actually have 10% more landscapers in the, in the industry today than we did prior to the Great Recession. Even though I estimate that we lost about 40% of those folks during the recession, we've seen a number of folks come back in because it is easy exit and easy in tree, right? Half truck will landscape. A lot of them, the mow, blow and go folks, they, 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 it's easy entry and easy exit, right? So we actually have 10% more of those, but we're still down about 14% at the grower level. Now, this is a, a chart of the po U.S. population by age. And they, Charlie, this is an economic presentation. Why do you have this? It's because a lot of the economics in this country is driven by demographics. And I'll, I'll show you that point here in a second in a different chart. But if you look at the number of people, this is everybody by age in this chart, right? And so those that are 55 years of age and more, you see in this box, 51% of those people have purchased chlorophyll at some point in their life, meaning they've bought a plant of some sort. And then that goes down, as you see, as the people get younger, in the 35 to 44 bracket, they got 38% that have purchased chlorophyll. And then only 30% in that 18 to 34 range. But I would imagine it's mainly consisting of those that are 25 and 34 years of age uh, that are buying the bulk of that. All right. So you got some two big percentages down here. Down below, you got 42%. That's, the, that's across the board, across all ages. Um, that, are, that are represented here, that's the number of people that have purchased chlorophyll. Now, some might say, well, that's terrible. I say, no way. That's tremendous upside potential. In other words, we've gotten to where we are today by only selling to 42% of the people. That means we got 58% of the market out there that we could tap. If we just reached another four or 5% of that, that would mean significant dollars for our industry. The 25% there, that's the number of people that have purchased landscape services at some point in their life. Again, tremendous upside potential because we see these boomers retiring to the tune of 10,000 a day. Yeah, you heard that right. I didn't, that, that wasn't a mistake. There's the number of boomers retiring every day averages about 10,000 a day. Do the math, 78 million boomers, 19 year uh, hori uh, hori retirement horizon. You do the math, 
about 10,000 a day on average. Now, it doesn't mean it's exactly 10,000 every day. Well, one point is we've got a lot of people retiring, and these boomers are the ones that put us on the map in the first place. They built the green industry, right? They're the ones that put the flower shrubs and trees around their houses. So those are the ones that as they age, they're still gonna be surrounded by flower shrubs and trees. They're just gonna be doing less of it themselves, less of the landscaping themselves, and they're gonna be hiring more of it done. That's why I'm very bullish on the landscape sector. You know, you saw that growth uh, in the landscape sector in the previous slide, it's gonna be growing even more. Now, even with the growth that we've had, and this is flower seeds and potted plants, right? It doesn't include trees and other woody ornamentals, but this is data taken straight out of the GDP data, right? This is personal consumption expenditure data by this category, flower seeds and potted plants. And floriculture was the most re uh, recession resistant historically, but even so you saw up here where my cursor is, we saw a tremendous decline in the number of flowers seeds and potted plants that people purchased and then we've been making our way back right and that's 2016 data the latest data that's been finalized we're still the 2017 data should be roughly where we were prior to the great recession right so it's been a long, long road for us to get back to this point however look at the slope of this curve and then i want you to look at the slope of this curve this is, um, these bars represent what we sell in terms of pet supplies in this country. Now you can see since 1994, when I started tracking this data, this is what we spent on our dogs and our cats. And you see the cute little puppy dog here, the cute girl and so forth. And they got an ice cream. Every speaker worth his or, his or her salt knows if you include kids and puppy dogs in your presentation, you're gonna get high evaluations. But, here I got the trifecta with ice cream. But look at these bars, all right? So we're seeing the sales of pet supplies, what we spend on our pets increase right up until the Great Recession, right? And sales fall all the way down here. They didn't, they still increased slightly, but slower growth, wrote a great rate of growth. And then as a, as a track forward, you can see that sales have gone up and up and up and up. They've never gone down. Why is that? Why do we have this sort of trend for plants? And why do we have this for animals? They're all part of that same biophilia that we have, that love for nature. It's just that animals have the advantage. They move, they come up and they, they lick us on the face. They, we come home from, from work and have a hard day. They make us feel good. And you see the quote there by my buddy Lowell Catlett, the retired uh, dean at New Mexico State. He did a talk like, 5,500 times, and his basic point was people afford what they want, all right? And so if you look at the pet supplies here, obviously we want something to make our pets happy because they make us happy. Look at this for plants, all right? So we, we, we want plants, but we don't have the same affinity. Now you say, well, that's just our pets, Charlie. That's, that, that's not true for all products. Ah, not so. This is real retail sales adjusted for inflation since 2005. And you can see the, the effect of the Great Recession, and then we see retail sales increase, right? So even the, what we spend in general is better looking in terms of the graph than what it was back here for flowers, seeds, and potted plants. Again, the most recession sector uh, within the recession resistant sector within the green industry. So we can't make that argument. My point is, is that plants are, are more than pretty. They, they enhance the quality of people's lives and people will pay for things that enhance the quality of their life. It's just that we haven't convinced people that flowers, shrubs, and trees are mechanisms that increase the quality of life because we've been talking about the wrong message. So we've been saying, in terms of what defines quality of life, you see all those constructs over here? social well-being um, and physical well-being, psychological well-being, cognitive well-being, environmental and spiritual well-being. This is a literature review that myself and a graduate student did over the course of a semester. And we looked at every single thing that influences quality of life. So, we, so I wanted to say when plants increase quality of life, I wanted to know what I was talking about. And sure enough, if you, in the literature, we found research studies that show that plants influence every single one of these uh, uh, 
concepts of well-being, right? Because we're more than pretty. Plants, there's a lot of words on this slide, but again, remember, this is being recorded, so you'll be able to access this. Plants are more than pretty, and so there's a lot of economic benefits of plants. There are a number of environmental ecosystem services benefits of plants that several of your growers up in the Northeast are capitalizing on because of the, the increased uh, uh, exposure and acceptance of green infrastructure. And, you know, the city of Philadelphia saves millions and millions and millions of dollars every year because of the green infrastructure. In fact, the city spends less on police force uh, officers and they spend less on police cars because of all the empty lots in Philadelphia that have been, they put in um, community gardens and they put in pocket parks. The point is they put in plants and not only do they save in terms of stormwater mitigation, but they, they, they're also addressing a huge quality of life issue and reducing crime in the city of Philadelphia. So, and Thank I want to- Charlie, get, can, yeah, can I yeah, jump yeah, in yeah. there? So, so in terms of uh, retailers taking advantage of these, uh, these trends, you know, what does this mean for growers? Oh, that's a, that's a great question, right? So, uh, and, and uh, I get often get asked that question when I when I get off of my soapbox and I'm saying this our industry needs to focus on these particular benefits and not just talk about the fact that this particular plant blooms all summer or it's this particular color. Uh, we we need to talk about these functional benefits. And the fact is is that many of these societal issues are issues that face every single one of us. So as an industry, we cannot simply rely on the retail sector. To, to, to talk about these particular benefits, but it's gotta be a cooperative effort. It's gotta be a strategic alliance, if you will, between growers and retailers and landscapers to make sure that this messaging gets out there. Because it, it, growers have a, have, a, have a response to make here too. I'm reminded of um, several nurseries across the country that have developed partnerships with their retail garden center customers and actually provided point of purchase materials for their garden center customers to use at the retail level that has little what if types of statements or did you know kinds of statements with pictures of all these benefits. And it's, it's a point of contact that's been very effective uh, in, in reaching in consumers. So that's, that's a great question. And I think this issue is not just a retail issue, it's, a, it's an industry issue. So that, hopefully that came across there. All right, so we got uh, bottom line, right? I, I didn't even talk to anything about economics yet. The point is, is that demo demographic trends are working in our favor, right? We have boomers retiring. We're, we have millennials that are coming into their home buying and household formation years. The, the demographics are gonna be working in our favor because for the last seven years, they've been working as a disadvantage because of the Gen Xers, right? There's 11 million fewer of them and mathematics has been working against the green industry because there were fewer people in the gardening and landscaping years of their lives. Therefore, mathematically, we were, we were rowing upstream. And so now those demographic trends are starting to work in our favor. Secondly, we have what people need. We just need to tell them what they need, right, to enhance the quality of their life. Thirdly, we have an opportunity to help solve societal issues. I talked about uh, reducing crime. I didn't even talk about health and well-being benefits. The fact that a kid with ADHD takes a 20-minute stroll through one of our improved landscapes, and it has the same effect neurologically as two of their medications. And I could go on and on and on how uh, plants and nature influence our health, uh, both physically and mentally. Yeah, I lost my father in October to dementia. It's just a terrible disease. And so one of the biggest or the, the most fruitful therapies for dementia and Alzheimer's patients has been horticultural therapy, taking patients outside. And when you see people uh, that, that are working at these clinics, there's reduced staffing. There's, there's uh, I mean, staffing turnover. The, the, the staff uh, actually uh, experiences the benefits from, from being surrounded by nature when they have healing gardens and so forth in those clinics. So we have all of these things working for us. 
the question that I'll answer for the rest of the webinar is, is the economy going to be the spoiler? And as I alluded to earlier, when I made my, it's time to make hay comment, we need to, uh, it, it's, it's not, but, all right, there's some things we gotta be aware of. First of all, let me clarify a couple of things. Stock market performance does not equal economic performance. Sometimes people equate the two. Stock markets raise and they, they go up and they go down based off of expectations, right? And we saw that all last year. There was an expectation because of the current administration being more uh, quote unquote business friendly, reducing regulations, that there is the, the perception of of a, a more favorable business climate. The stock market reacted to that, in spite of the fact that it took a long time for the, any of those things to come about. Now, the second thing is consumer confidence does not equal economic performance. And I'll show that in a slide a little bit earlier. You will hear in the media that you know the, the consumer confidence is up, therefore expect retail sales to be up this, this holiday. Or what, we heard that over Christmas there's not a direct correlation there, right? It's not a strong correlation. There's somewhat of a correlation, but it's not a strong correlation. The fact of the matter is, is there's more of a correlation between our population and number of people working and GDP. This top chart right here is our current annual rate of change in GDP. And so we've been averaging about two and a half percent from two to two and a half percent over the last decade. And that's probably going to continue that We'll have some short-term uh, increases in GDP that may get a climb close to 3%, as we saw at the end of last year. But on average, the annual rate of change in GDP is going to be around 2%. And so people may say, well, Charlie, that's, that's kind of bad. Then over here, I've got the plow horse in this picture rather than a big, sleek, thoroughbred racehorse. The fact is that 2% is slow and steady. And remember, we're a $19 trillion economy. And to count to a trillion, it takes you 36,000 years. Now, you don't believe me? You just, all right, try it for yourself. Go ahead. It'll take you 36,000 years just to count to a trillion. And we have a $19 trillion economy. So which is better, to have a 2% of a $19 trillion economy or to have 3 or 4% of a 10 or $11 trillion economy as we used to have? All right, so you see the, the differences there. This bottom chart shows a polynomial curve sent that's, uh, that was calculated through uh, the number of people working, that is the labor, and then GDP. And you can see it tracks very, very closely. So even before the Great Recession, we economists were saying that we can expect a, over the, the, the next two decades for GDP to be a drag there because of the number of people declining in the workforce. And that's exactly what we saw, all right? You didn't hear it in the media too much, but we've seen the, exactly that correlation. All right, so let's, I mentioned GDP and the, uh, this particular chart has the breakdown on the four major categories, what you and I spend, what businesses spend, exports, and of course the purple part of these bars is government consumption. You can see the consumers, the blue portion of these bars, you can see I'm, I'm, my cursor, I'm following the blue portion of the bars. That's what you and I spend. Consumer spending is about 70% of GDP. That you will hear in the media, and thereby you, you know the importance of the consumer in terms of driving our economy. Now, you may remember the movie City Slickers, and, and the, when Billy Crystal asked Curly, what's the secret of life? He held up one finger and said that, the, the secret of life is, and unfortunately, he kicked a bucket before he told uh, Billy Crystal what the secret of life was. But in this chart, you know, I'm oftentimes asked, Charlie, if there's one number, one number that I should look at each month to kind of get a feel for how the economy is heading, what would it be? I don't have the time to track all these indicators you do. What would be the one number? Well, this is it, right? To, Conference board puts out a leading economic index and it's 10 different indicators rolled into one and they're all here in this box down here. And you can see that this is a leading indicator and it's, that means it's a foretelling of how the economy is gonna be doing nine to 11 months down the road, all right? And so you, if you track this, this lower box, the last 12 months, it's been increasing. 
So this latest uh, report showed that it was increasing. So by and large, that, that sort of tells me that this spring, we should see an increase, an uptick in the economy's performance, ceteris paribus, right? And they come back to that term, holding all of the things constant. Now, there's some other indicators that are pretty positive as well. This is the number of people filing unemployment insurance, right? Those that don't have jobs. You can see since the, uh, the recovery started, that's been going down. And this green line, this horizontal line, is about 400,000 claims. When the economy gets to approaching that particular line, it generally demarcates a recession is imminent or we're in recession. And you can see we're nowhere near that green line at the moment. So that's really good news. There's a job report that you hear the media talk about a lot. And it talks about the number of jobs that are open as well as the number of people that are, that are fired or their layoffs and discharged. This blue line in the chart here represents about 6 million jobs right now that are job openings. So right now, what does that mean? That means right now we could be hiring 6 million more people. We're already at 4.1% unemployment. We could be hiring 6 million more. Now these are non-ag jobs. And of course, Farm Credit East uh, does a lot of lending to the, the agricultural sector and the green industry uh, included. If you consider all the ag related jobs nationally, that could easily be 25 to 30 million. That's why immigration is so important. That's why that issue needs to be figured out. And we could be 25 to 30 million short. So I've made a joke in several of my presentations over the last year forget building walls. We need to charter buses. We need more people in the ag sector to work. And it, you ask any grower out there, and with their biggest issue, labor, by, by and large. You know, I teach an, teach an executive education program for nursery and greenhouse growers, and right at the beginning of that program, we talk about some of the major things impacting uh, their particular business. They always say labor right now. Now let's switch gears and talk about housing, because housing is directly correlated with the performance of the green industry. All right, we saw that rather dramatically up here in the housing starts chart up here on the right. We saw housing starts fall off precipitously, right, during the recession, and then our climb back. And it's a fairly constant climb back, and you can see the forecast that's uh, in the future right there. All right, so by and large, because the leading market index and the home prices have been up, there's been a very favorable outlook for housing that's been developing. But there are a number of headwinds, right? There's a number of headwinds. Because of the hurricanes last year, you may remember, down on the Gulf Coast, there's a huge demand of lumber. Now, I, uh, on I-35 coming through Texas, you know, where I'm located, man, there's Home Depot trucks headed south uh, to, the, to, the, to the coast because there are 55 coastal counties that were impacted by the hurricane and not just Houston, right? So 55 counties. So that's pushed lumber prices up. And oh yeah, by the way, the tariffs on softwood lumber, that on Canadian softwood lumber, that's been a major hit to the housing industry. And you said one of the headwinds is last bullet down here. A lot of talks about aluminum and steel tariffs, right? Lately, that too will have unintended consequences on the housing industry. That's going to have a negative impact on particularly the cost of goods for home builders, right? We already have a shortage of lots. We already have a, a labor shortage, a shortage in terms of the number of people available in the construction sector. They have the same issues as our green industry folks, right? And we're in a, we're in a rising interest rate situation. So mortgages are going to be a little bit higher. So we do have a few headwinds there. Hey, hey, Charlie, just while yep. we're talking about housing, uh, what about the, the impact of the recent tax cuts? Yeah, that, that's another thing. Um, yeah. By and large, people tend to think that most tax cuts are always favorable. And the, the difficulty with this particular tax cut, you know, the Tax Cut and Jobs Creation Act, was, was um, first of all, it's in the wrong stage of the, of the business cycle, 
right? We should have been doing this back in 2009. So we're, we're getting ready to ramp up in an already uh, warm economy. And so we may, we, we run the risk of, of inflation occurring. However, for the housing industry, you know, there were several things. As I think about these over the top of my head, obviously the, the, um, the tax cut lowered the mortgage interest deduction down to three quarters of a million. Um, it capped the deduction for state and local taxes, including property taxes, at about 10 grand. It, uh, it doubled the standard deduction for joint filers from, from uh, uh, the 24, 000, to 24,000 from 12,000. And then it eliminated the deduction of interest on, on home equity loans. And of course, it, it decreased the corporate tax rate from, from 35% down to 21%. Again, these have mixed implications on the housing industry. First of all, if I'm a home buyer, I just lost some of my tax incentives. There was that if I was on the bubble in terms of making that decision time, in terms of whether to buy that house or not, I, that's that was a, a factor that would have pushed me over the fence to buy. Now I don't have that incentive. And then another area is um, we've seen an appreciation in our home values. Fortunately. If you look, I mentioned up here in the second bullet, home prices have been up year over year. Fortunately, we've not gotten back into the bubble situation and those home prices have not risen too quickly. Now they're going to rise even more slowly. So the appreciation of our homes for us homeowners that are out there, that appreciation is going to go down um, uh, considerably. And then we may actually see some relocation across the country going from, if you, if you look at local taxes, we may move, see more people migrating to areas where there's lower tax rates there locally. And then of course, the flip side of that is that there's gonna be some home builders that are gonna make some more money because the corporate tax rates are lower. But that's gonna be probably more heavily weighted towards the larger home builders. So th there's, there's always positive and negative externalities. There, there's some, there's some there's some positives that for us as consum as homeowners, but then there's as potential home buyers, there's obviously some disincentives that fall into place. So we're going to see how this shakes out. By and large, time I think it's going to mean that the housing industry will still grow, but but perhaps at a little slower rate of growth. That's a good question. All right, so let's move on here. Uh, again, just another indicator of a favorable housing outlook. The National Association of Home Builders has their housing market index and anything above a 50 where this this pinkish area here basically represents a favorable outlook. So, you know, by and large in all their surveys, even in terms of home renovations, there's expectations of things being better. The top chart here shows uh, the leading indicator of remodeling. Now, landscaping doesn't fit in there but it is a proxy measure, it is correlated. So that's why I include it there. So because you see this remodeling activity index starting to, to increase the way it is, we should see landscape remodeling doing the same thing. That is, we already have our landscapes in place and we need, the, the, they do, while they do appreciate over time, and we know that landscaping, a good landscape contributes about a dollar nine for every one dollar that's invested. In fact, it's the only home improvement that generates a greater than one dollar return for every one dollar invested. Right? My wife and I, the, the 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 contractor just showed up this morning to do major demolition on our master bathroom. Right? I won't even tell you what I'm spending on that master bathroom, but I'm going to be very disappointed as an economist because I know I'm only going to get seventy three cents return on every dollar we spend on that bathroom. Unlike the outside landscape where we get a dollar nine for every one dollar. Now, down here at the bottom uh, chart, this is the sales of Lowe's, Home Depot, Walmart, and garden center sales. That is building materials, garden equipment, supplies, dealers. That's the next code that, that shows that and it's, that is projected to increase as well. All right, I already mentioned we have more millennials that are reaching that, that home housing uh, household formation age, they're starting to buy it, they're starting to, 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 to purchase more homes. 
But what's holding them back is a credit. You see this red in this chart right here? That's student loan debt. That's $1.3 trillion. Remember I told you it'd take you 36,000 years just to count to a trillion. So when we talk about millennials being not uh, forming households and not buying houses as quickly as their predecessors, that's one of the reasons. We, they're saddled with $1.3 trillion of student loan debt. So if you look at debt altogether for everybody, you can say we're at an all-time high for debt. Look at where it was before the recession, this gray area right, right in here. And look at where it is now. You know, after the recession, we deleveraged. We, we got rid of a lot of debt after the, in the first few years following the recession. It scared the bejeebies out of us. So we, we got rid of a lot of debt. But look at this. We're back in it. And we're coming in. We're pushing the envelope in terms of the next recession. From a household standpoint, we're, we're wearing thin on our working capital. So that, that, that's one of those things where I just kind of scratch my head and say, this is a grenade that's going to come off at some time. Now, if you look, all, look at this debt, you can see that over the, the, the last decade, inflation has been held really at bay, right? It's, this is both the, um, the consumer price index and the per personal consumption expenditures index. The, the Federal Reserve basically looks at the red one, and the media tends to pay attention to the blue one. But that's why the Federal Reserve has been reticent in increasing interest rates, because we haven't really seen a lot of inflation. And that's the primary function of the Federal Reserve, is to curb inflation and to provide an atmosphere for job creation, right? And so, but we're sitting here in terms of, of what's the impetus to raise interest rates if there's not a lot of inflation so we're starting to see this this creep back up in terms of inflation again uh, it's 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 really going to depend on on wage increases in terms of how this proceeds in 2018. now i mentioned interest rates <laughs> this is a cool chart right here this is the past Federal Reserve chairpersons, right? We got Volcker here, and we got Greenspan, and we got Bernanke, and we got Chairman Yellen, and of course Jerome Powell is, is the new Federal Reserve chairman. And interest rates are in this line right here, and you can see they're directly correlated with their heights. <laughs> it's, it's a joke I never get tired of telling. It, it cracks me up, that's why I keep putting it in here. And, and there, that's just a, it shows you there's a, there's a big difference between causation and correlation, right? So since Jerome, Jerome Powell is taller than Yellen, we know that interest rates are going to go up. Uh, anyway, I apologize, but it's, it, that's, that's some funny stuff right there. One of my, the things, I have a quote over here from one of the last FOMC meeting, the, the Open Market Committee, that, that is going to meet. Um, Let's see, when's their meeting? The 20th to the 22nd, I think. I think it's next week, Charlie. Yeah, 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 it's next week. And we'll probably hear the announcement of maybe, I don't know, even from 12 to 25 basis points, the increase in interest rates. I, I think we're, we're going to see that. And because the, the Fed has got to be moving still on this quantitative easing. So we'll, we'll still, we'll, and you look over here in this red, um, I think the, the Fed realizes uh, that we've gone a little too far, and we're going to, we're going to turn back time a little bit in terms of of the uh, ability for folks to, uh, to get that capital. All right. So in terms of net worth, this is an important chart right here. This reflects just like every business that's online right now has a balance sheet and income statement. You got a, a you got a net worth. Um, that you know, assets minus liabilities equals net worth. So do households, and you can see that our net worth has been increasing in terms of our households. It's been increasing, and it's still getting better. So that's 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 good news. But do remember, I want to call your attention back to the credit that we're taking on. And so again, that's that's a time bomb. Now incomes, we typically will spend the amount of money we earn. It's, it's kind of amazing, right? Any pay raise that we get, we typically spend that. And 
you can see the nominal increases in our incomes in this purple line here. And then when you adjust and account for inflation, that's the real levels of purchasing power. We've been roughly the same, basically where we were, just a little bit above where we were in 1970, right? So we haven't made a whole lot of progress there in terms of our real incomes, but we do spend what we make, right? And so generally the better that we feel and it's correlated to those incomes and whether or not we have jobs, we at least provide some sort of, of basis for more expenditures. Now notice I said some sort of basis for more expenditures right there, because um, the interesting thing about this chart is, look at consumer confidence here. This is wh where we were prior to the recession. And you know, we, we feel really bad. We're in a miserable recession. Of course we would feel bad. But then we feel better, then we feel worse, we feel better, we feel worse, we feel better, we feel worse. You see the, the volatility? That's more volatility than in the stock market. And the fact is, is that our, how we feel is based off the latest sound bite. I mean, we vote by sound bite. Why would we expect that these confidence numbers would not necessarily react to sound bites as well? So we have these increases and decreases in confidence. Now, I won't go so far to say that this, this particular economic indicator is totally useless, but I will say this, this particular economic indicator is totally useless. <laughs> and yet the media talks about it all the time. That's, that's some, let me make a point right here. Do not let the media shape your strategic vision for your company, right? Your strategic insight have to come from you knowing enough to know the difference. So we cannot let the media shape our strategic vision, right? So I don't care how people feel. I really don't. I care how they spend their money. And it goes back so Charlie, to- Charlie, speaking yeah. of that, how does that then translate into sales of you know, plants, shrubs, and flowers? Oh, great segue, right? Great segue right here. Another great question. Folks, you're asking some great questions. Appreciate that. So again, I really don't care about how people are feeling. I care about how they spend. So if you look at how we're spending our money, look at, look at this trend. This is real retail sales. That is adjusted for inflation. Sure, we're not on the long-term trend that we used to be. We're, we hit a new normal, right? But we're tracking closer to that red line. That's the long-term trend. That's aggression line fit through that, all that data. So this, this particular blue line is getting closer to the red, but it's also increasing. And look at the, uh, do you see that volatility that you see here? No, you don't see that volatility. So it's not always about how people feel. Because remember my buddy Lowell's comment, people afford the things that they want and they're going to buy things that they want. So Tommy, to answer your question, if we can convince people that flower shrubs and trees are what they want, they will spend the money on that. But we can't talk about the fact that we're only pretty. We have to talk about that plants are functional. And we've got uh, you know, a group of folks uh, in the Northeast there that are part of the Synergy Group. You got several of your growers, they're part of a Synergy Group. And this particular group, they, they have a, a, a new uh, type of plant or a new branding campaign they call Hand Picked For You right? You can Google that. It's, it's a website up there because you've got some very progressive nurseries up there in the, in the Northeast. And so that hand picked for you means that you can buy these flower shrubs and trees and you can be assured that they're going to perform well in the, in the landscape. And oh yeah, by the way, you're going to get all these health and well-being benefits, environmental ecosystem services benefits, and economic benefits to your home in the process. So Again, Tom, I think that means that we, we should see sales increase this year, right? We're, we're so poised for it. And as long as Mother Nature will cooperate and not beat us over the head, <laughs> as y'all are getting snow right now, right? <laughs> as long as Mother Nature will cooperate a little bit, it should be a banner year. That's right. Good question. All right. So that takes me to this one. When will the next recession start? And of course... Um, I always joke around that we economists are, are pretty good. We've predicted 23 out of the last recessions. <laughs> and, and we're, but we do have a better tracker, track record than weather people. I'll just say that. 
All right, so there's four basic things that I look at. The first, uh, when I'm answering that question, the first is the St. Louis Federal Reserve Office puts together the, their financial stress index. You can see that our financial stress before the last recession and how that went up just skyrocketed. And you can see this particular index is well below what it is or what it was even prior to the Great Recession, right? Even in the heyday of financial sector performance, where our financial risk right now is lower, banks are basically in a much better cash position than what they were prior to the Great Recession. All right, so that's that's one thing that they we, they've learned their lesson. So that that kind of thing won't catch us unawares again. And if we have a little bit of relief on on Dodd Frank, then it will be well, even better. Second thing I look at. The Chicago Fed puts together this National Activity Index. And I told you earlier that the leading economic index is 10 different indicators rolled into one. Well, how about 85 different indicators rolled into one, which is what this represents. And you see this dotted red line right here? When this particular indicator approaches that dotted red line, it basically, again, means that we're going to be moving more towards a contractionary period rather than expansionary period. All right, and you can see right now, we're well above that. All right, the next thing, I look at something that's called a yield curve. All right, and, and many of you have probably heard about the yield curve through the media or otherwise. It's basically the difference between 10-year treasury bonds and three-month T-bills. And as that gap narrows, right, and becomes negative, it can be a foretelling of a recession, right? In fact, you can see in this particular chart, an inverted yield curve, that is when the short-term uh, return on T-bills, three-month T-bills is higher than 10-month treasury bonds, that's predicted the last seven recessions, right? So right now, we're not in the inverted uh, yield curve yet, right? It is the gap between three-month three T-bills and treasury bonds is, is lowering, uh, but it's not negative yet. So we're still in, in pretty good shape. Now, having said that, I read a white paper the other day that said we should be comparing 10-year uh, treasury bonds to the federal funds rate rather than the three-month T-bill. They're close, but they're not exact, right? So when the, then the federal funds rate equals, if you look back over the 10-year treasury bond rate, when whenever that uh, federal funds rate gets it intersects the lowest point, and I've got my cursor on over here in the, the chart on the right. When it intersects that point, it's at that point in time that a recession would usually is occurring within 17 to 36 months. Now, what I like about that is that you've got a little more lead time than simply using these other uh, Chicago Fed, the St. Louis Fed or even the, the next slide, the leading economic index. You, you have a little bit more time that uh, you can use this particular. So what that would say is when, when uh, in, back in December, when the, when the Fed increased interest rates another 25 basis points, that, inter, that was the point at which it intersected the lowest point of that 10-year treasury bond. So that would mean about 17 months from now, that would put us in about mid-2019, or into 2020 before recession starts, right? So that's, that's a very important point. And again, I come back to this leading economic index because one of those 10 indicators that's rolled in here is indeed that interest rate spread between 10-year treasury bonds and the federal funds rate, right? So that's one of the indicators and that has been going up. So again, that leads me to say that in 2018, I put a very low percentage chance on recession occurring. In fact, I say 25% chance of recession before this time next year, right? So 2018, I think we're good. Up until mid-2019, I think we're good. Late 2019, maybe early 2020, that's when I think we, we may see the writing on the wall but ceteris paribus. Now, notice this, I said this includes a 15% risk factor. What I mean by that is that really, I'd say about a 10% chance of occurring this year, right? But, here's the but. 
all those risks, the production, environmental, marketing, all those risks I talked about earlier at the very first webinar, those are what we got to contend with. And there's a couple of big issues like trade, like immigration, like water, in which we don't know what that's going to look like by this time next year. So we've got to figure out the trade. In fact, if you look at the GDPs by state, all but 10 have double digit influences of trade on their state GDP. So it is muy importante, as we would say here in Texas, very important that we fix this trade thing. And it's, uh, I, I got it, it's not by tariffs, folks, because we, yes, NAFTA needed to be updated, right? There's no doubt, but we cannot throw NAFTA because particularly Canada and Mexico are two of our most important trade partners. And like I said, with uh, steel and aluminum, it may have a limited impact on Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, but a lot of that infrastructure has already left, right? So it's, it's almost too little too late in terms of the steel industry. But I told, talked about the negative externalities on the housing industry when you start putting tariffs on softwood lumber, when you start putting tariffs on steel and aluminum, et cetera. And then I will carry over to the commercial real estate sector as well, All right? So... 25% chance, but I'm, I've got a little caveat there that 15% of it is what I true, call a true unknown risk factor based off of some of the big issues. All right, so that leads me to my final slide, all right? We know, as I've, said, as I've hopefully have pointed out, that 18 should be a good year for us, all right? It's time to make hay but we need to have a contingency plan because all those folks that we lost during the great recession, all the growers, retailers, landscapers that we lost, they didn't exit the industry because they didn't grow a good quality plant. They didn't exit the industry because they didn't sell and merchandise a good quality plant. They didn't exit because they didn't uh, install and maintain a quality plant, right? They exited mainly because they were over leveraged because the bank had more skin in the game than they did because they didn't manage their inventories properly. So I, you see this little, this is a football coach holding his game plan, right? It's laminated. Well, I'm encouraging businesses that you got to have your contingency plan for the next recession in place right now. And that sucker has got to be laminated. It can't be on the back of an envelope because you, you've got to be able to, you got to work with your farm credit East partners in terms of developing that contingency plan making sure that your working capital is in order because that was the major downfall of all these businesses. The major reason they left was because of mismanaged working capital. They simply didn't have the cash when they needed the cash. Again, they had the quality plants, didn't have the cash. Got to have that contingency plan. You've got to manage those inventories properly. And you got to work on that value proposition. And it's, it's, it can't be the fact that it's pretty. It's got to be, talking more about the functional benefits. All right, so I'm, 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 I'm winding down and I can tell because I'm having to take bigger and bigger breaths because I've been going so fast <laughs> and trying to get so much there. So at this point, I'll just stop and ask if there's any more questions. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Charlie. Uh, yeah. Great presentation, a lot to think about there. Geez, if you, if you hadn't made it as an economist, I think you made a pretty good banker with that last plug there. <laughs> <laughs> um, exactly. So, so, uh, a couple of questions have, have come in here. Uh, one is you going back to some of your earliest slides as you were talking about the uh, the increase in sales following the the large decline for the green industry following the Great Recession. What about imports? Is is that a part of the story? Do we see much in the way there uh, in, in this industry? Yeah. Uh, well, for our industry, it's limited because we have the plant protection quarantine, right? So. We, we, we don't see a lot of export import, but there, there's only, I think five, there's a handful of varieties that are imported with soil on them. But most, most plants that are imported have to be soilless. They have to, you got seed, you got uh, unrooted cuttings or callus cuttings and so forth. In Latin America, obviously we have a lot of our propagation that goes on. And that's imported because you don't have roots on it and you don't have, uh, more importantly, soil on it and gotcha. soil-borne diseases and insects that can, that can creep into the country. 
So because of uh, APHIS uh, PPQ, plant protection quarantine, that's, that's limited the export and input, ex export and import on the green industry side. Now it's, it's not insignificant, but it's not nearly what it is for other sectors. Great. So it, it, another question here for you. So as you, and going back to one of your earlier slides, the, when you talked about the decline in the number of growers from the Great Recession, mm -hmm. what about total pr production? I guess either measured by, I guess in this industry, you typically think of it more in sales as opposed to say like a volume as you would think of in other, other um, industries. But, you know, number of growers has declined. What about total production? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I'll separate it by production and sales because we, we used to have sales data uh, from some of the USDA reports, with, but they discontinued the nursery report in 2006. They just discontinued the floriculture crops report. So unlike cotton, soybeans, wheat, and so forth, we, got, we have nothing in terms of, of government support in terms of the statistics regarding our industry. That's why the researchers that I'm a part of, the Green Industry Research Consortium, we do our survey every five years and like I said, I mentioned at the outset that that's going to be occurring at the first of next year. So um, in terms of, of sales, I don't really have a good feel. I just have an anecdotal that sales have been increasing. Now, in, in regards to production, where I thought you were heading with that question is that even though we're 14% fewer in terms of number of firms, not all of that productive capacity capacity has left the industry, it changed hands, all right? So there were some entities that, that exited that were purchased uh, by acquisition by other, by other firms. And so it's really hard to gauge, and that, this is where next year's survey will help answer that question, but it's hard to gauge right now exactly what that percentage is. But you guys know, and I know from all my travels around the country, that, that not all of that productive capacity left the industry, but it's hard to gauge exactly what percentage that was. Right. Okay, great question. Charlie, if you can, we're at the hour here. I got two more questions I'd love to get to sure. if you can hang with us. Um, I'll talk fast or faster. <laughs> so one of them came in um, talking about uh, sort of the retail end of it. I know a lot of growers, uh, you know, sell through local garden centers, but there's obviously the, the big box stores are a, a big piece of the marketing picture here in this industry. Um, uh -huh. Talk about that, and what about, um, say, a, a retailer like Amazon? Is this an area they've gotten into at all? Yeah, if you look at the, the percentage that Lowe's, Home Depot, and Walmart, and, and other um, mass merchandisers, home improvement centers, um, um, the, the hardware stores, et cetera, if you look at that side of the retail, it's, it's basically 80, five to 87 percent of the total market right retail garden centers range from from 11 to 13 percent uh they they lost market share when walmart first came on the scene but then walmart lost market share to depot and lowe's that's they, they they i've never seen that before right walmart lose market share to to other retailers and but that did happen in the green industry so they they're they're a big bulk of the market, right? And so retail garden centers, some may, no, wait a minute, I said uh, 10 to 13 percent, I meant 20 to 23 percent. They have backtracked theirs, but still it's kind of the 80-20 rule. 80 percent are the are the big big boxes and then 20 percent independent garden centers. It varies by year, but again, uh, we have to deal with the data that we're given, and so that's that's the best that we can we can work out. I don't project that that particular ratio is going to change that much and the question is then becomes how much will the amazonization that's a big old word how much will I think the, it's a new word. yeah 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 i just made that up and that's that's part of the great thing about having a phd you can make up words and but the <laughs> amazon the amazon effect how, how much is that going to, well, if you go on right now and you look at the plants that are being sold on Amazon, they're not cheap, right? There's an incredible profit margin on those plants that sold through Amazon. The jury is still out. We have some of our growers um, and a couple in the Northeast that are developing facilities to be able to sell directly to 
consumers through Amazon. And so, the, the, again, the jury's still out. We're, we're going to be watching that very closely. Is it going to take over what Lowe's and Home Depot and Walmart have, have generated and, and all the hardware stores and so forth? No, because if you look at how people buy plants, primarily it has been with the eyeball. And so uh, there's, there's still that. I, I want to reach out and touch it. I want to experience it at the retail level. And I, that's something I don't think will, will go away altogether. But do we, be, do we have to be cognizant of this multi-channel phenomena happening in our industry? Absolutely. Right? Okay. We, we have folks that, that use the Internet very effectively in selling their product. And there's, there's others besides Amazon. There are other entities that are selling directly to consumer, and they do a very good job. And I, I've, I've ordered some of those plants just to see what kind of shape they would come in when they got the, to my house. It's remarkable the transformation versus 20 years ago. So again, we're going to see some some progress towards that. It's I don't see it overtaking the market. We just have to keep tabs on it. Okay, great. All right, Charlie. Hey, last question here for you. So we're talking about yep. the marketing side. Getting back to the production side. Any from your work in the industry, are you seeing any regional grower shifts? Uh, you know, say into or out of a region. Say obviously we're interested here in the Northeast in terms of uh, that uh, that phenomena, or are there per certain parts of the country that maybe uh, you're seeing a shift of production to or from? Um, not necessarily just a shift in production to and from, but as part of the, the acquisition, I started to say merger and acquisition, but it's been more acquisition uh, activity that we've seen over the last five years. It's been more of a um, uh, a market development strategy. You know, look at ANSOV's um, product market matrix. You got a market penetration, penetrating your existing markets and market development. You're going into other markets and you got product development, you got diversification. Well, this is a clear market development strategy that several growers have used to grow their business. And you, you take a, a firm, um, yeah, I, I don't want to mention names, but there's been several that have purchased other entities and other regions that to have a more of a national presence. And I think that opportunity will continue because there, there are very few channel captains at the retail level. And for certain products, it lends itself to there being a retail channel captain at some of these larger big box stores. So I think that's a, that's a concerted strategy to, to garner more of a presence nationally. And mm -hmm. uh, it's again, it's not for just woody, or woody ornamentals across the board. It's not just from bedding plants across the board. It's for selected things like succulents and and uh, foliage plants and those kinds of things. Specific sectors. That's been a very successful market development policy for some of our growers. But I don't see growers moving their operation from one region to the next. Much like you saw in the hog industry, right, or the tobacco industry where the, the folks migrated to other areas of the country, primarily for regulatory reasons or, or reduced regulatory reasons. And be, well, none of that is, has necessarily been occurring um, because of those reasons. It's been more of an acquisition strategy to grow your, your business. Okay, well, great. Well, Charlie, I appreciate you hanging in there with us and appreciate our attendees hanging with us uh, a few minutes past the hour, but it's, it's great to hear your perspective. And so we thank you for, uh, for your presentation today. As you can see on the screen, you can always check back at farmcreditist.com slash webinars for recordings of past webinars, as well as uh, our upcoming webinars. Uh, we'll be having one in uh, May on, the, on our dairy farm summary. But again, appreciate everyone joining us here today. And uh, Charlie, best to you as uh, here in the springtime down in Texas. So take care. Yep. Thanks very much. Thanks for the invite. Thanks for being here, folks.